Good afternoon, everybody, and um, apologies for the uh, the slight delay in getting started this afternoon. We're just um, trying to get our final speaker uh, connected. But uh, while we're doing that, can I just wish you all a, a very warm welcome to this, uh, the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Artificial Intelligence, and our third in a series of meetings uh, to discuss our contribution to the, uh, the National AI Strategy. Now, we started this process back in May uh, of uh, this year, when we got together with businesses, academia, um, think tanks and experts from across the piece uh, to work out how best to frame our, our contribution to the strategy. And we decided on three meetings. Uh, the first took place in June, which looked at the ethical, safe and trustworthy development of responsible AI. Uh, in July, we looked at resilience in the face of change through an emphasis on skills, talents and R&D. And today we are going to look at uh, growth of the economy through widespread use of AI technologies. And to do that, uh, we have uh, five speakers um, to, to help explore that. So the format for the today is going to be, I'm going to invite each of our speakers, and I can see that they are now all with us, um, to speak for uh, around five minutes. So I'm going to be tr try and be quite tight on time so that that leaves us with half an hour at the end or so uh, to ask some questions. Uh, usual rules of uh, engagement on Zoom. Uh, please keep yourself muted if you aren't uh, speaking. So uh, I think that's all I need to say. Uh, Birgitta, I don't know if you want to add anything to, to that. Uh, no, I don't want to add anything. We don't have a long time today. So uh, I look forward to hearing what everybody has to say and a uh, good discussion. Thank you for that clarity. Um, let's uh, start off then with our first speaker, which is, is uh, Sue, uh, Daly. Sue Daly, Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Uh, Director, uh, Director of Technology, of Technology and Innovation, and Innovation at, at Tech UK. UK. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, five minutes, please. Oh, well, hi, Stephen, and hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, as the, um, everyone, I'm sure, already knows, uh, Tech UK, we're a trade association representing the UK tech sector as a whole, and uh, part of my role is to lead our work on tech and innovation, which includes uh, our work on AI and all things data, of course. Uh, we've been working on artificial intelligence for a number of years now, looking at the opportunities and how do we make sure that making the UK AI ready, very supportive, of course, of the AI sector deal. And we look forward to the national AI strategy coming um, out. Uh, and we have always focused on really this key topic of, um, yes, it's important to create and support the AI industry as a whole to develop and grow in the UK. And of course, I'm sure we'll touch on many of the, the issues that are important to the industry uh, um, today. But it's also important to look at not just building the industry, but also um, it, it developing the markets and the opportunity for adoption, deployment, and use of AI technologies that's going to be really key. The field, my Kevin Costa the field of dreams, you know, build it and they will come. Well, we are building it. Now we need people and organizations to adopt and use AI. So how do we do that? And so we have a unique insight into what the market is seeing and what companies are seeing from our more than 850 member companies, ranging from SMEs, working in AI and other technologies all the way up to the, the global players. So I wanted to share with you a few areas that we think are really key to um, you know, looking forward of how we really drive adoption, deployment, a use of AI um, technologies going forward uh, to help obviously drive and um, build economic growth and recovery. And of course, uh, as I'm sure others will say, COVID crisis has really accelerated digital adoption in many sectors and then has given us a real momentum, I think, to build on. There's a, a, a digital foundations in place as well, particularly from the digital adoption that companies have had to make during the pandemic, which I actually think wasn't there before. So we're perhaps as and not starting at the beginning, but we're starting at a different pace for this conversation, which is interesting. But that hasn't necessarily changed the nature of the barriers. Um, that were a number of them that were still there before the pandemic and are still there now. And also some of those legacy issues that I think are still, are still with us. But it's just perhaps that we're in a different um, position to have this conversation now, which, which is really encouraging. So we've identified, um, in the interest of time, Stephen and others, three uh, barriers where we think action is still needed to make a significant difference. And um, those three are skills, 
and expertise, and I'm sure uh, that will be a theme of today in talking about the skills gap. Two, access to data, and particularly high quality data, and we can come on to that in a minute. And thirdly, thinking about the funding as well of how do we help particularly SMEs to adopt and use these technologies as we go forward. So firstly, skills and expertise. We know that as an industry, we're creating more jobs than we than ever before. And competition, particularly for technically skilled employees, is fierce right now. Last week alone, we saw job vacancies reported by ONS over a million for the first time since records began. And over uh, or, or almost 100,000 of these were within the scientific and technical profession. Lack of skills is continually brought up as a, a barrier to uh, AI adoption and, and deployment, um, development and ad adoption within uh, not just the UK, but at the global level, as we all know. And we know, of course, from the AI fit to deal and the work that's happened over many years, there's a lot of activity that's been going on around AI skills and education, which is really excellent to see. I think now is a good opportunity to you know, revisit that conversation and look at where are we now, what the progress has been made, what more do we need to do? For example, you know, looking at reskilling and retraining. Um, one proposal that we would like to share is that we uh, last year outlined the idea of a government-led digital learning pathway, which could be a toolkit um, which would allow, uh, or a platform that will allow um, citizens connect interested in the digital workforce, interested in training material, and in interested in roles that are available to connect, to see the path that they could take to, to, be, to come into areas such as AI. We also believe that there's a, uh, the work that the uh, Office of AI has done around guidance for AI procurement in, in government and public sector, how could they possibly be um, develop similar guidance for other industries and other sectors that would make it, again, to my mantra of easier, not hard for organizations who perhaps don't have the full technical capabilities that they may have in their teams to adopt AI, but something else we'd like to explore. Secondly, the, is the access to high quality data. We know that data, of course, is a valuable asset for all businesses and organizations, and many are challenged still with data complexity, quality, legacy infrastructure issues. Um, and we, we think there's still a lot more that could be done here about opening up um, data and data sets uh, to make it, you know, to help organizations that are looking for access to data. And I think the National Data Strategy work could offer a real opportunity here to look at how, how that can be done. About 30 seconds, so. Sorry, thirdly, and thirdly, funding, um, particularly for SMEs uh, that are still perhaps um, looking for help to adopt and to implement, particularly data data analytics, and I would say also add into that cloud services, you know, the, the digital foundations that are really key to making AI a reality. So looking at things like um, the R&D tax credits that we've, you know, we believe should be extended beyond what they are for now and look at data analytics and cloud. But also we've been calling for the introduction of a digital adoption fund of 100 million to help SMEs and first time adopters um, get access to digital services and technologies, including AI. So Stephen, I will leave it there, but there are three kind of key asks. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Sue. And as you said, um, starting with skills, I'm sure there'll be questions around how do you reach those people who might have the potential, but don't necessarily know about the opportunities. So uh, hopefully that will come up. Right, let us uh, move on to our second speaker, which is Gilbert uh, Wusu, who is... Uh, Data and AI Director, Corporate Units and Networks at BT Group. Um, Gilbert, could we please have uh, five minutes from you? Thank you very much, um, Stephen. It's quite interesting. <laughs> As you are the same top three that I have. Um, of course, on skills, probably what I'll add to it is that there are two sides to this. One is what technical and domain knowledge are required for successfully implementing AI in enterprises. However, most AI training programs uh, tend to focus on technical skills. Yeah, and we believe that to speed up the adoption of AI in enterprises and SMEs in particular, more government support is required to scale up training and, and to allude to, to uh, there's about what I like to call out is that partnering with organizations along the lines of apprenticeship schemes, um, women in data and, and code for girls. This is to help 
um, bring up those aspiring to pick up AI skills with a domain knowledge required, not just the technical skills. And also educational institutions um, also need to help students understand the current limitations of AI and important ethical um, questions around their applications. Of course, second um, barrier that's to uh, um, highlighted, same um, for, 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 for me here. Um, I think some of the missing data uh, when it comes to quality uh, of data that Sue mentioned may be publicly available or may require collaborating with other organizations. For example, we know that infrastructure data is created and owned by many asset owners. Okay. What, what is needed is the creation of a unified um, set of ontologies, vocabularies, and standards for data sharing. What we have observed is that collaboration across sectors on data is difficult, and this wouldn't happen automatically. And there are challenges uh, around data ownership, identity protection, data control, governance of data assets um, that must be addressed to enable data sharing across organizations. And um, our view is that more funding from government is needed to enable a cross-sector wide sharing of data and to also enable enterprises to easily assess the outcomes from programs. You know, and Sue, Sue mentioned some of these, such as the information management framework, the national underground assets register, and the national digital twin. So I believe that there should be incentives for companies to share data. Most organizations view data as their uh, intellectual property. Okay. Uh, and then enterprises also need robust policies which protect sensitive data from abuse and protect customer privacy backed by appropriate government legislation. On funding, what I'll add to what Sue said was that helping SMEs to, to articulate return on investments related to AI um, projects or programs um, will, will be helpful. And um, we, we believe that, again, the government has a role to play um, in here and um, also support AI related work placements that will help address the skills gap. Then finally, for me, it's around um, selection of vendors. A recent report by Forrester says that the global AI software market to grow to $37 billion by 2025. We are seeing a number of vendors offering AI products and services. The, the, question, the question, is there a standardized way of assessing these vendors? Could we have something like the energy sticker for white goods or the CE sticker for appliances? What we need is a rigorous and consistent vocabulary to talk about the varying types of AI applications and the risk and issues associated with them. Clearly there is a need for open technical standards for AI components to ensure that they have been developed in a robust way and that they are predictable and can be controlled. So th these are the four that I would like to highlight. Indeed, and I think uh, the theme of standards and accreditation is one that has been uh, discussed, well, fairly regularly. And I'm sure one of the things that people may want to explore uh, later is whether or not there have been any there is any progress towards establishing those standards, whether it's data standards or standards of coding in terms of accreditation of algorithms and AI. So uh, thank you for highlighting uh, that. Right, we will now move on to our third speaker, uh, which is Anna Thomas. Uh, Anna, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Anna is the co-founder and director at the Institute for the Future of Work. Anna, can we have uh, five minutes, please? Um, thank you very much, um, Stephen um, and Bajet, for having me. Um, um, as um, Stephen mentioned, I'm director and co-founder of the Institute for the Future of Work, which is an independent charity with a mission to shape a fairer future through better work, um, which I set up with um, Nobelist uh, Sir Christopher Pisarades from the LSE and Naomi Clymer. I'm a technologist and former president of the Institution of Engineering and Technology. 
Um, I'm going to interpret the overarching question of this session broadly, if, I'm, if I may. Um, all our research points to the importance of developing an overarching long-term strategy and framework for human-centered automation um, that aims at, at promoting people's well-being as well as their prosperity um, through the transformation, which is we call the 4II, the technological uh, 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 revolution uh, that we're experiencing at the moment, um, which is overlaid by COVID. Um, this approach recognizes the central work role of good work in getting there, that good work is really important in itself for people and for families and for sustainable businesses too, but also because it short circuits um, an answer um, to other very difficult problems in tech innovation and regulation in building or rebuilding uh, to be resilient to shocks, economic and health shocks. Um, in levelling up, and it was great to see Andy Haldane reference that as he was appointed to the levelling up committee in the last few days, um, and in also thinking about the respective roles of responsible business and responsible government. Um, so what does this mean? This means aiming far and, and aiming high, and also means tackling as part of it, part of thinking about AI strategy and part of thinking about growth, those difficult problems associated with the UK labour market, um, rather than uh, wait, ignoring them or waiting until uh, they have caught up with us. Um, and so that includes the precarious nature of work in the UK, because um, polarisation, growing polarisation of work, the skills gap, and a very high level of uh, different types of inequality across the country in terms of access, terms, condition, and quality of work. Um, uh, so, uh, looping back to some of the questions um, and uh, jumping around a bit so as not to repeat the other excellent presentations we've heard, um, what impact has the, uh, has the global pandemic had on enterprise adoption? Um, it's accelerated for sure um, through the pandemic in response to new demands, um, initially the need to reduce physical proximity, but increasingly the need to redesign business models and practices too. Um, and we, we, we've, had, we've seen this reported and, and had it ourselves in surveys um, and in interviews at a national firm and individual level. Um, for example, 60% of firms adopted digital technologies and management practices at March to July, and 42% and of workers report their job has changed over the past year as a result of digital technology. So predictions of automation appear to vary, but actually they reflect different thresholds and uh, definitions about what is automatable. And estimates have settled around 15 to 30% of tasks. Initially, we were looking over a decade, and that seems to have accelerated uh, at perhaps more to, more, more to more like five years than 10 years. Um, uh, I should flag here that these estimates tend to focus on technical capabilities um, and systematic collection of data on technology so as to be able to assess this, which would really help you in answers to your questions, um, is limited at the moment, and we're campaigning for better labour market statistics um, uh, on technology adoption, national statistics, rather than those associated just with um, uh, individual advisors and consultants. Um, there's increasing evidence that automation can affect uh, job access terms and quality in both positive and negative ways, depending on your purpose um, and how it is implemented. And we're working with the CIPD and other stakeholders very closely to develop guidance about how businesses can implement uh, technology um, in a way that will both grow uh, their business, businesses that promote growth, but also promote uh, the well-being of individuals, both workers and those who are exposed to the technologies. Um, uh, for example, IFOW have identified new drivers of polarization at work, including the expansion of insecure and low paid jobs, uh, the health safeguards that come from the computer effect, about some uh, economic advisors suggesting a pay premium goes to those who work with computers who can now work remotely too. And about also, 30 seconds, Anna, that's okay. Uh, and also a hike in the use of worker tech. Yes, I'm going to leap through them to my um, uh, some recommendation, key recommendations 
um, and come back to some of the other parts. We uh, very, very, very much uh, recommend and hope for an AI strategy centered on human flourishing and well-being uh, in which the role of good work is, is recognized. Uh, we suggest new functions and funding streams for the AI office and council um, uh, and also the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, similarly focusing on how we can promote real innovation um, in the UK and in small businesses, um, focus around good work um, and research streams too. Um, which um, to ensure the UK leads in the design and development of human-centred automation. We also recommend a new tech innovation grand challenge targeted at stimulating innovation in human-centred automation um, aimed again at creating better work. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, uh, we've had discussions around this uh, previously about the impact, but I think what I took away from what you said at the beginning of your remarks is that uh, COVID, as it has been in lots of other areas, is a great accelerator to some of these things, uh, and particularly the impact on work. So perhaps we'll explore that a, a bit later. So thank you for that. Um, our fourth speaker is Amy Challen, uh, who is General Manager Data Science from Shell. Amy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, could we have five minutes from you, please? Well, thank you very much. And um, my job title is actually General Manager for Artificial Intelligence, which is the uh, best job, job title I've ever had, I'm sure. Um, but I'm responsible Brilliant. for driving delivery and adoption of AI technologies in Shell. Um, and I started my career in academia, so I've got quite an experience of um, the challenges there as well. Um, and joined Shell a few years ago to help scale up advanced analytics there. And this is because in the energy sector, AI is a critical part of how we manage the energy transition, both in terms of improving the efficiency of everything we do, um, but in also developing new businesses and sources of energy for the future. And AI isn't really the solution here, but it's a huge enabler of how to get the chemical and physical solutions to how to generate and store new energies and new business models. So uh, we enabled uh, about $2 billion estimated of um, improvements last year through digitization. Um, so to just to think about what happened um, and what are the barriers been, I think some of the greatest barriers are very similar to what everyone else is saying. So talent, technical talent in AI, but also project management, process change, um, domain expertise as well. A second one is investment costs. It's one of these things which costs money. And if a business is doing okay, um, it's a very easy investment to put off. So upfront incentives to do that, subsidies to do that can really help. And a similar piece is around business prioritization. Even if you have the, the cash available, if you don't have the capacity, you're focusing on too many other things, there's too much other change. It's a very difficult thing for a business to really focus on that. So the, it's interesting with, the, with people talking about the impact of COVID, because I think the, um, the pandemic certainly increased digitization. I'm not sure it necessarily increased AI in all cases, but AI often feeds off digitization. So I think it's a step in the right direction. Equally though, particularly at the beginning, because there was a huge reprioritization towards making the business survive, what do we need to do now? Actually many activities, I think in many industries dropped off substantially. So I think also recognizing that while we're experiencing difficult economic times, which is still the case, Businesses and other organizations will need particular help in being able to prioritize these kind of investments. So in terms of the opportunities where I think the government can positively influence AI adoption, the first one is clearly the skill sets. Um, I think from the point of view of generation of AI in real on the ground implementation, one of the things that worries me is this is an unavoidably international area. My teams are across four time zones. Um, I don't even think of them as being in a particular place. And unless we're open to having people work here from elsewhere who've got a PhD in the relevant topic, then we're going to find it very difficult to, to maintain a leading position in the world of AI. And similarly, if unless we're open to people moving around and encourage that um, to study, to work, it's going to be tricky. Um, similarly on training. 
um, some of our most successful collaborations have come with um, other with the UK universities. So we have a very, very strong partnership with Imperial College, but also Cambridge, Oxford, Exeter, Glasgow, and many others. And this is in the form of internships and research collaborations. And this is critical for many businesses to really keep connected with some of the cutting edge and some of the more basic research that's going on. And while there are several government schemes to sort of promote these kind of um, collaborations, what's really key there as well is, aside from the people piece which seems to work out well with internships and so forth making sure that research institutes and collaborations allow industry to take be a joint part in defining um, the agenda but sometimes if it's purely an academic driven partnership it can remain a little at the theoretical level um, it really needs to be putting this to work in in the problems of today that industry comes across um, and a third piece, again, in common with the others um, that mentioned, is the data and technology to support um, all, liberating all companies of whatever size to be able to develop um, AI. And that is common technology platforms, common standards about data structuring and access. And an example of this is Shell's involvement in the Open AI Energy Initiative, where um, with Baker Hughes, C3 AI, and Microsoft, it's a platform where companies of any size can license out um, their AI solutions to promote adoption in the energy industry, which will get us sooner to net zero, but also enable a company of any size to be able much easier to find customers there. And these are the kind of initiatives which will really help smaller companies, startups in particular, actually find the platforms and the data so that they can really develop and drive. Do I have Brilliant. any longer? Yeah. Um, I, I was going to give you 30 seconds, but you actually oh. <laughs> bang on five, five minutes. I'll stop there. So, thank you very much. Um, I mean, one of the areas that I would uh, perhaps uh, like to explore, or maybe someone else will, was about how you use your position as a large organization to help your own supply chain understand the opportunities that uh, AI can can bring to them. And so maybe some of that will, will come up. If not, I'll ask it later. So thank you very much uh, for that. And we'll move on therefore to our final speaker, which is David Short. And David is Technology Director, BAE Systems. Uh, David, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, could we hear your thoughts on this? Yeah, Five sure. Minutes. Yeah. Um, so uh, my background is uh, very much in the defense sector. Uh, my, my own personal background has been working in the aerospace sector for, for a number of years and more recently working in effectively what is a central role looking at technology across the corporation from a BAE systems point of view. So it's not just looking at things from a, a purely UK perspective, but we do a lot of work you know, in, in, in Australia, the US and, and also parts of the Middle East. And in terms of the, the way in which uh, we can see uh, the application of a AI and how it's actually evolving, clearly it has uh, you know, application across the whole spectrum of things that we do, everything from initial concept design type work right way through to the way in which we apply AI into some of our platforms and systems and analogies I could draw maybe along the lines of, um, you know, even when we're talking in the civil sector about looking at medical imagery, et cetera, a sonar return or a radar return, the use of AI to interpret an image to actually get a better understanding about what's going on is clearly a, a parallel that we can actually, that we can draw. And, and even using AI for the way in which we maintain our, our equipment, look to the future and try and get some predictive analysis associated with the way in which our systems are to perform and how we can actually preempt uh, problems and issues. And I think all those are in parallel with what you would see in sort of mainstream everyday life. And just in the same way, um, as you would say, you know, in society in general, the amount of data that's being generated, the amount of uh, capability that, uh, and options to use AI they are in the defense industry uh, are, are, are exactly the same. Areas which maybe bring in some, some differences and some ish areas of concern maybe is that um, when you look at it from the point of view of working in defense and actually having competitive products, uh, there is a huge amount of uh, investment taking place with some of our potential adversaries to actually try and gain advantage through the use of some of these techniques to actually allow for uh, better decision making and more rapid uh, uh, maneuvering when it comes to the battle space. So if I look at it from the point of view of the traditional way and you think about defense, it's land, it's sea, it's air. These days we're talking about multi-dimensions uh, or in, active at the same time, including as well as land, sea and air, we've got cyber, we've got space. These are very complex 
environments with lots of data and there is a need to be able to interpret and transpose that data to allow human machine interaction and, and decision making in the timely way you know i think in terms of uh, if you go back through history when it comes to defense often there's a build up to a problem there actually can be um, you know uh, you can see the enemy coming if you like over a period of time but these days the first indication that might be something that's taking place which is really quite serious could be in the form of say the cyber attack where some of our infrastructure starts to to be disabled that could be the start of something which then has a kinetic effect that comes later on and there's a lot going on in a short space of time and there might not be that period that uh, we've had historically where human communication can start making the right sorts of decisions in a very manual way we have to be able to absorb a lot of data and bring that to the to the actual decision makers in a very effective way so there's quite a lot of drivers both from the point of view of uh, the operational environments the way in which we uh, have to come up with creative and novel designs when it comes to things like our manufacturing and manufacturing options we've used uh, intelligent algorithms to come up with really quite novel solutions which would have taken maybe from a human input a long period of time to actually come up with that sort of solution historically so it's a fast moving environment and i'd say from a skills point of view clearly there will be areas where the application of ai is actually going to be able to alleviate some of the need for the more mundane tasks in the short to medium term but i would say our net position would be there's really probably quite significant growth both in systems engineering but also in, in ai to actually be competitive from a uk national perspective in that defense arena so i would expect there to be in that short to medium period a a, a, a growth in requirement of, of engineers and I, that's going to be quite challenging because we already have quite significant shortfalls of skills in the systems engineering area so uh, artificial intelligence in conjunction with system engineering is going to be uh, a challenge for, for for our sort of industry so i think there's um you know a number of aspects which uh, are really quite important as we go forward and in terms of actually looking at areas that we we think are really important to actually focus in on and actually have some sort of uh, particular focus I mean, it's difficult to say something completely original when it comes to um, what's been said already in terms of recommendations. Clearly, skills, training, awareness at a very early level in schools associated with what careers might look like associated with this uh, capability and technology and actually making it really attractive uh, for the broader application of, of a, a artificial intelligence. Uh, but also, I would say About that... 30 seconds, David. That's yeah, okay. I, yeah, that's fine. Uh, the, the other area I would say is, uh, and we've talked about uh, earlier on the regulation and the trust aspect just in the same way as we have safety integrity levels when it comes to safety critical systems artificial intelligence uh, criticality and the ability to trust it in a way in which is measured but also fits in maybe with uk ethics the, the ethical uh, parallels and that not all countries are the same when it comes to the way in which some of this will be applied and i think uh, although the barriers to entry into uh, artificial intelligence from the point of view of development of products can be quite low, getting them to the required level of certification that the, that the community can trust it, I think is something which is a challenge that could also be an advantage for the UK if we focus in on the right areas. David, thank you very much uh, indeed for that. Um, some very interesting stuff. I often wonder whether or not there is enough understanding uh, in our education system about the opportunities that AI and automation algorithms present to get young people to to look at the point at which they might make a, a choice about future learning and future careers and you know, how we, we recreate that link that I fear that may have got lost and I'm sure that uh, BA systems have uh, quite a lot of experience in trying to recruit and inspire young people yeah it's often, just one thing I would add to that is it's often something which isn't a familiar topic for some of the teachers and advisors because it's one generation on in terms of the opportunity yeah and that 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 is a big piece of work that perhaps we've all got a part to play in in helping them understand brilliant thank you very much indeed uh, to all our presenters uh for uh keeping ish to time and for uh, sharing their thoughts with us um so now we're going to open up to uh questions and i'm going to ask Bagita first if she has any thoughts uh on what we've heard I and mean, it may be um rather than just make it a complete free-for-all if people want to stick their hand up but i do have a question from both uh, jim matthew man and uh, tony clark so i'll go to those after we've heard from begita begita 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, I found you know, really, really interesting uh, conversation about how AI can stimulate uh, uh, industry adoption, growth and well-being. There's one question I have kind of across the board, and that is that we have also done at the Big Innovation Center some hardcore analytics of about uh, uh, 2,000 AI companies and 1,500 investors into AI that will be published uh, very soon. We do find that the most AI adoption is in marketing and advertisement uh, by a far mile, followed then by FinTech and health. And way, way down, we get education and energy and go, go tech. Uh, when it comes to funding, we find that um, the, the, the fastest increasing funding is also in a marketing and advertisement, although that FinTech receives more funding. Uh, and we find that 70% um, of uh, the activity on AI is in the London region. So my question is, should, do you think the industrial strategy here when we're implementing that, should that have some priorities around sectors uh, and places, or should we just look at where the market takes us? Who would like to uh, share some thoughts on that? Uh, any of our panelists just chime in if you've got a uh, yes Amy thank you um, I certainly think that um, it's helpful to prioritize sectors because as I was saying it was um, there are specific investment barriers to adopting AI even though it can be in the benefit of a particular organization and in the industry as a whole um, and obviously if if the marketing piece is there already it's an easy one to make but it, it's in these other places where the barriers are a little bit higher so I definitely think that um, prioritizing like and asking where we really need to help make that push could be a very effective way of making sure that we all benefit. Thanks, Amy. I don't know if anyone. So. Yeah, I was just going to say I would agree with that. I also think perhaps as a way of doing both. So, you know, sector focus absolutely, and, and again, perhaps you look at not 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 those at the top of the list, but those further lower down that list, and how we bring them up to the higher end of the list. But then also looking at where those hubs or where those clusters of those sectors and industries are in the UK and how potentially that could create, you know, that, that kind of regional um, drive or regional hub um, uh, around AI adoption and deployment and really show what's possible. So there may be a way of, of, of doing both, but it's finding where those regional hubs or um, uh, ecosystems exist. And then potentially, you know, looking at how you really drive AI adoption and use or the, or the story around what AI could do in those areas as well. But definitely a lot more work to be done in terms of making sure the benefits of AI and, and the conversation around what AI could mean is, is spread across the whole of the UK, I agree. Brilliant. Thanks, Sue. Um, Anna, did you have a thought on that? Um, yes, I think that's a really good question. We're really good at the UK in innovation, um, but not at dispersal. Um, and so we've done um, an index on resilience with White Shield um, that shows very much the need for the UK to accelerate responsible adoption of technology right across the country. And then the ICT and tech indicators in the index are giving a really mixed texture in the UK. We're better on infrastructure than actual uh, than, than, than dispersal in particular. Um, so the, the package, the sort of 1.25 billion package in future fund for sector support has accelerate, has helped, I think, accelerate technology adoption adoption um, to some extent, but the impact is really uneven and regional inequalities, including innovation and technology to to access to technology are not addressed. Um, so I think it is really important to think about the sort of regional aspect as well as the sectoral one. Uh, thanks, Anna, that's great. Right, just before I do uh, go to uh, Jim and then Tony, I'm going to invite my colleague from the House of Lords, Chris Holmes, to uh, ask his question. Chris. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all the speakers for not only excellent presentations, but a great degree of coherence uh, between all the presentations. So to the specific issue of economic growth and the economic imperative for the UK, how well do you think in terms of the government's role, the government are doing, feel free to score out of 10. Which nations around the world, specifically on this economic growth imperative, do you think are currently winning? And to narrow all of the excellent stuff you said down, 
what would be your one, the key ask for government? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, who would like to rate the government out of 10? I can't believe <laughs> yeah, the hands have shot I, I, up. I could. Uh, <laughs> Gilbert, uh, please. Yeah, well, difficult to, to, to rate out of 10, but of course we do know the investments that countries like China are pouring into AI. And um, clearly that, that needs to be um, looked at closely in, in this country. I, I think in terms of areas that a government can help, a, a number of fronts. One, one is, um, and I touched on this earlier on, is about data sharing, encouraging enterprises to share data and providing incentives for them to, to, to share data. This would accelerate, um, in, in our view, the adoption of AI across the board and also enable um, SMEs to, to, to get on board quickly because it costs a lot of money to be able to get good quality data. And without that, you can't really have any um, good models um, for, for AI. So I, I would say that, that that needs to be looked at and, um, you know, with all the standards and, and, and you know, uh, um, regulation that, that goes around data. Thank you for that. Uh, anyone else have a, David? Okay. Um, so it's, in terms of rating the governments out of 10, that's an interesting one. Uh, in terms of uh, looking at it from a, just purely from a defense perspective and a perception of how things are actually going at the moment, I would say, because I've, I've been working with the US for some time, I'd say the level of investment and the urgency that goes into that investment for that competitive defense position, is very, very uh, much stronger in the US, I would say, than it is in, in the UK. And there's certainly a buildup of urgency also in Australia, uh, we would see, because I think the perception of threats and the level of investment. And, um, you know, um, we've just been talking with Gilbert about the, you know, the investment in China, for example. The Chinese investment from a defense point of view is absolutely enormous when it comes to AI and cyber. And so that is seen to be a threat, which you get a response uh, to that from the point of view of those who believe that it could actually work against them. So, you know, Australia has got you know a feeling of needing to move at fair pace at the moment. So I'd say that the UK is warming up to it, uh, and I would say that uh, that there's, it's stronger in the US and maybe slightly stronger in Australia at this point in time. As a very diplomatic, without scoring it absolutely out of ten. <laughs> Thank you for that, David. Um, Anna. I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very tricky question. Um, but if pushed with a gun against my head, I'd say somewhere around at the moment, five, five, six, probably more six. They've it's the, the importance of an AI strategy has been recognized. The fact that technology underpins growth recognized, the fact that we need a strategy and we need regulation recognized, that there is certainly some support for innovation and sectors and leveling up, although there could be more and they're not very unified. Um, there are sort of examples across the world, including Canada, Netherlands, the France, of early attempts at thinking about regulation. The EU, obviously, proposal, um, although in fact, in terms of work and people, it's not very rigorous. It could be, it could, uh, and it doesn't really think about impacts on work in particular. Um, uh, we still have the potential, I think, in the UK to lead on responsible innovation, but it's really, really important at this point that we don't take a sort of light touch, short sighted approach um, aimed at addressing just what's right in front of our nose, which you occasionally get wisps of, for example, in the innovation task force. Um, or the new proposal to cut digital rights, that we really do need to sort of own and tackle the trickier aspects of it um, uh, uh, and sort of set that vision and aim, uh, aimed at sort of, uh, uh, well, you know, well-being and human flourishing um, to aim for the next 10 years and not uh, just cope with crisis in the next, in the next two. Thank you, Anna. And I think so. Have you... Yeah, I'm gonna. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm going to also avoid the, the rating. Sorry, but um, you asked, you know, uh, nations around the world and then key asks for, for government. So, just very briefly, I think you know we have to be realistic in terms of the UK. We are obviously as a country not the size of the US, which is a huge market. We're not the size of China, which is obviously a huge market. So then you look at well, what can the UK do, and where's the UK leading that could really be 
positive and empower, empowering and powerful, particularly, you know, as Anna was talking about responsible innovation as well. And that was just getting my thinking going of, I do think where we are leading and where we've been leading for some time now is the conversation around how you deploy and adopt and use AI in an ethical, responsible way. And how you not just do that from a, how is an organization using AI, but how are they developed and how are they deployed and taking that kind of ethics by design approach. And I think that's a really powerful, um, you know, um, strength for the UK and one we need to be proud of, but also one we, we can't be complacent, right? We have to continue to that important work, particularly as AI adoption increases. So a key ask for government, therefore, would be continue to fund and support bodies like the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. Really important that we have it, really strong in the UK. Um, you know, a great new advisory board that's just been launched as well. That would be one of my key asks to make sure that the, the UK can continue to drive forward the debate and discussion around how you get um, AI adoption, not just right for the economy, but a right for society and people as well. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Right. Now, I think we'll go to uh, Jim Matthewman. Jim. Hello, everybody. So, uh, first of my question, I was a global HR consultant to over 2,500 uh, organisations around the world, and now an AED advisor to tech, manufacturing, retail industry. My question really is a people and work question, which is, I wonder whether we just got a branding issue around AI. I know this is a discussion you've probably had already, but I mean, the reality is we got one in four of uh, the adult population in the Western world will be over 65 in the next 10 years. They're not really very comfortable with this. Uh, we've got 40 to 50 year olds who are concerned about and quite fearful of their jobs. And we have these images of a robotic takeover. And we know that is not what AI is. So the reality is it's here, it's everywhere, it's anywhere. So I just wonder whether we need to have, uh, for the UK at least, an intelligent automation, because actually this is all about advanced computing, which is exactly what it is. And we need to be in a much more empathetic, people-centric post-pandemic world. That's my question to you as a, a body leading this debate. Jim, thank you for that. And um, Anna, I think is gonna go first on that. Um, I think that's a really good question. I mean, something we're doing is rather than sort of rebranding it, but reframing automation to try and help the debate move on from just um, yes, exactly. the, uh, uh, you know, the robots are taking our jobs debate to what's actually really going on. Um, and we've got a new report which sets that out in detail, the Amazonian era, which I can circulate on the chat, perhaps if helpful, which looks for sure at substitution of tasks and jobs as one aspect of automation, but points to in fact five other impacts which are just as important and prevalent, um, including task and job creation, but also uh, augmentation of some uh, skills and jobs, telepresence, transference, um, and intensification, where some um, aspects of work are made more intense um, over time. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Anna, I don't know if anyone else wanted to add anything to that. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, in which case, I'm going to ask Tony uh, Clack for his question, which I think sort of follows on a little bit from that. Tony. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, what are the views of the panel on uh, job disruption and eventually net job loss over the next 20 years? Because my perception is that most of the thinking that's going on seems to be relatively short term about job disruption. And uh, I think we're potentially neglecting contingency planning for the sort of level of job disruption that will actually come. Um, and even if you don't believe there will be a tipping point where there is a net job loss, then we still ought to be contingency planning for that. And it doesn't seem to be part of what's going on at the moment. And I, I noticed that Daniel Suskind, uh, who gave evidence at one of the earlier sessions, um, was very strong on this and he's written a very good book, A World Without Work. Um, so I'm just very interested in getting discussion going on, on the, some of these downsides uh, 
which can be turned into opportunities, but, but look like downsides at the moment. Um, who would like to respond to that? Um, Amy, thank you. So I can't comment 20, 30 years out, but I do think, um, I do think there'll be job changes short run and medium term. I don't know that AI is any different from any other sort of major technological advance that's happened over the past 300 years. Because I think whenever you get those kind of advances, some jobs disappear and new ones arise. And that's a huge challenge for anyone who's in the middle or the end of their careers to change in this way. And so it's a huge responsibility for the government to look ahead see what's going to be disappearing in five years time and really start preparing so that people can reskill and find different areas to go into. Um, I think the, the kind of the more extreme scenario of will there be 20% of people in work only in 50 years time, I'm not sure. Um, I still can't see it myself, but I do think certainly medium term, there should be very active and forward looking support for everyone um, young people, but particularly older people as well, to reskill, retrain, and, and look for new work. Uh, yes, thank you for, for that, Amy. Um, Tony, I'm... Um, the, uh, I mean, the one difference about AI is that potentially any new jobs created can be replaced by AI, or at least partial jobs which are AI people, AI, AI, AI augmented uh, with people and certainly Daniel Susskind sees it that way and I think it, it does need to be taken seriously and as I say even if you don't agree with the, with the fact that there will be eventually net job loss we ought to be contingency planning for that situation and one of the good things is when you start looking at that contingency planning you find there are lots of good things that we can do now that are just helpful in job disruption situation as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Gilbert, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, Stephen, I, I mean, I, I think at a local level, enterprises, um, and I believe they, they are doing this, have programs in place to ensure that the employees are properly upskilled. Okay. Um, I think Anna mentioned, you know, automation really frees up in our, in our experience, frees up people to do more strategic thinking and help them to make quality decisions because they can spend their time, instead of cleaning data or doing rudimentary type work, focus more on how they can run scenarios and so on. So AI for us, it's, it's more augmenting the way this, you know, the decision-making process, okay, and empowering that. And in our, I think we, we the, the panelists also mentioned shortage of AI skills. I mean, we are seeing that there is a lot of work that needs to be done, but we don't have the people to do that. I mean, of course, whilst maintaining the existing um, legacy estates that we have. Thank you for that, David. Thank you. Yeah, just one quick input from Alan. I think in terms of you know personal perception, I think in the in the in the short to medium term, there is probably going to be a net increase because it creates options and and it, and we you know we we do need to actually um, work some of the, the problems that we can see that AI will be a, a solution to. But I suppose the, the other thing that would be worry uh, from my point of view in terms of uh, where job losses could take place is actually just fundamental competitiveness. Um, if you've got, um, you know, uh, a competitor, uh, whether that be a nation or it be another company, that's able to employ rapid uh, design, rapid manufacturing, new techniques. It's being accelerated through AI. There's a real risk associated with if you haven't got it, the gap gets too big, and all of a sudden you're no longer relevant for that new marketplace. So I think if you're looking at it from a national point of view our industry being able to be competitive and actually to, to strive forward in the medium term and actually have those products and having those iterations of opportunity is going to be key for us to protect our own position. I'd be more concerned about that in that sort of foreseeable future. Uh, thank you, David. And I'm just going to um, take one more comment, I think, from uh, Phil Hall, if Phil's still there, um, to put this into... Uh, Potential perspective, Phil. Yeah, you know, hi folks. Hope we're all doing well out there. The um, 1940s, sorry, 1950s, is quite a good reference point. Um, uh, we did some work with the IM Echo Book Show at the University of Sussex some um, four or five years back now, and there was a lady there 
I'd have to dig out her name, it's not on the top of my head, who was doing some work on people's attitudes and expectations of automations through robotics in the 1950s. So I think I'd overall, or at least from the work that I've been doing for 20 years in conversational AI, um, that the, uh, the, the loss of jobs overall is sort of sadly misplaced. It's, um, it's not going to be manual labor, it's going to be mental labor. I think we need to think quite clearly about what is and isn't strategic, um, what is and isn't randomly added by algorithmic content to generate discussion. So, so it still needs a lot more thought, I would say. But go back to the 1950s. Everybody thought we'd be retired from then, and we are not. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Phil. I think that makes a, a very good point. Um, I mean, one of the reasons we set up this group now five years ago was because of concerns around job displacements and some of the, the lurid headlines that were being bandied around at the time. And I think, you know, obviously, the work for all of us changes over, over time. And it's whether or not the pace of change outstrips our ability to create new opportunities. And I think that's really what it is. We haven't seen mass employment from moving from us all working in the fields uh, to now mainly working over the last 18 months, many of us from home. I think it's just about the balance and the pace and keeping uh, an, an eye on those changes. But Tony, your point is well made, that we do need to be looking at different scenarios about what does happen um, as more and more AI is adopted into uh, business, well, into our daily lives, really. So yeah, it's a point well made. Um, I think on that point, I'm gonna thank uh, my speakers, Gilbert and Sue, uh, to Amy, David, and where are you, and Anna. Thank you all very much for your contributions uh, today. Thank you also to uh, the Big Innovation Centre for being the Secretariat for uh, the All-Party Parliamentary Group and for keeping us one of the most active groups. And of course, to uh, Desire, who um, we work very closely with, who helps pull these meetings together, uh, which I think are very informative and will help, as I said right at the beginning, inform our contribution to the national AI strategy. So thank you for your input and I hope to see you all again soon at another APPG AI meeting. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>